Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, what I believe to be the uh, the fifth session in this series. Uh, my name is John Collins, and I, I work with Parkinson Society Central in Northern Ontario. Uh, sending regrets from from Karen, who won't be joining us today, but I do have Sandy with us to deliver what I'm sure will be a, a very engaging and thorough presentation. So. Thank you for making time to join us. It is 1.30 and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I should note that if you have any questions as we move along, you can feel free to enter them into the, uh, the chat box located on the lower right hand corner of your screen and uh, Sandy will either address those as she moves along uh, or we'll, we'll make sure that they get answered before the end of the session. So. I thank you for joining us today, and with that, I turn it over to our, our very own RN, Sandy Jones. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, and good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sandy Jones, and I have been the nurse educator at the Parkinson Society, Central and Northern Ontario, for the past 16 years. It's hard to believe. The time has certainly flown, but that is indeed how long I have been uh, in this position. Uh, John mentioned about your questions. Um, I don't multitask very well, so if you don't mind, um, I will answer the questions at the end of the presentation rather than trying to keep an eye on that and just sort of basically focus on the presentation and we'll, we'll take it from there. As I began to prepare for my presentation today, I was looking back at other talks that I have given on coping strategies for caregivers over the years. Some things that I will be talking about have changed within the health and social sector in where and how to access help. Some of the things I will mention to you today may be things you have already heard from others or even experienced firsthand. So whether you are a new care partner or an experienced care partner, it is my hope that my talk today will help give you some direction in the unknown waters that you journey on. I find that many articles are written about the Parkinson's journey and I would just like to talk briefly about the fact that I think when most of us start on a journey we basically have an idea of where we're going, we have an idea of where we would like to stop along the way, what clothes we might need depending on what climate we will uh, require, what kind of um, transportation we're going to need to get to where we're going to go, etc. The Parkinson's journey, however, is literally unknown waters. You've started on a journey, it wasn't one that you planned, and nobody can really give you much of a map or a guide as to what's going to happen, what you might see along the way, what you're going to experience, and how to cope with it. So that's the reason I called today's journey Mapping the Unknown, because I really think that for many of us, going on a journey where we have no destination in mind and nobody to guide us, no map to go with, it's, it can be a very, very difficult one. So originally, today's session was supposed to be with a different speaker, and truthfully, I wasn't supposed to be involved. But due to some unforeseen circumstances, plans went awry, and we were faced with a mini-crisis of what to do. Karen called on our CEO, Debbie Davis, and myself for help, and we in turn called on our teammates, John Collins and Robert Terstieck, for help. I know my strengths and weaknesses, and while I love to talk to people, presenting via a webinar is a very new uh, format for me. I hope you will be patient with me, should there be any glitches, as I'm sure there will be something. And that is a summary of today's talk. Don't wait for the crisis to occur, but ask for help right away. And forgive yourself at the outset for any mistakes that you will make. You need to practice what Betty Claire Moffat calls preventive forgiveness. This is when you forgive yourself now, today, and every day, and sometimes several times a day, 
for not being able to meet all the needs of the person you love. It is important to set limits for yourself. For example, I can do this, but I can't do that. Caregivers are masters at providing help, but there seems to be a stigma attached to asking for help and, even more importantly, accepting help. People think they can do it all. However, no matter how much you love the person you are caring for and no matter how much that person loves you, there is no way you can meet all their needs by yourself. You cannot heal them, you cannot make them happy, and it is not your fault that your loved one has Parkinson's. I have yet to meet a caregiver that did not give enough. But you know what? It can never be enough. People with Parkinson's needs are too great. Maybe not right now, but they will become too great sooner than you think. And guilt is a synthetic emotion that often gets in the way of accepting help when you need it. As I mentioned earlier, things can creep up on you because nothing happens quickly with Parkinson's. That said, the disease does progress over a lifetime. Someone begins to experience symptoms. They get the diagnosis and they start medication. The right balance of medications is found and someone continues on, often quite well for a number of years. They experience a change in symptoms. Medications are adjusted and again the person continues on. Symptoms begin to worsen. The specialists adjust medication as best they can, but options may now be more limited. Advanced symptoms can start to appear, and a person may deteriorate. Quite often, the focus of the doctors, whether it's the GP, the neurologist or the Parkinson specialist will be on the physical or motor symptoms and it may be up to you to flag the non-motor symptoms. I say it's up to you as the caregiver because the person living with Parkinson's may not be aware of their non-motor symptoms nor their impact on you. Let me give you a clear example of someone else's problem impacting you. A person who snores terribly may be getting a fairly decent sleep, but it's the spouse who has to leave the bed, wear earplugs, or be kept awake all night. While there may be some excellent treatments and strategies available to manage non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, doctors can't fix what they don't know is broken. In truth, sometimes it is not the motor symptoms but the non-motor symptoms that truly causes difficulties for care partners. We don't often talk about some symptoms, such as personality changes that can come with different levels of cognitive impairment, but even more so with dementia. We hear from caregivers that suffer quietly from verbal and sometimes even physical abuse from a loved one who may be experiencing dementia. Even worse is when care partners feel that they are somehow protecting their loved one by not telling the doctors about such things as hallucinations. Those are things that people see that are not really there. Delusions, those are beliefs that the person may have that are not true. For example, a person may believe that you, the spouse, are having an, an affair that is simply not taking place. Or they may believe that you and or their children are stealing their money. Again, that's a thought.
that is not based in reality. Or they may even think that the person uh, living with Parkinson's, other things that they may be showing, and these are some of more easily corrected situations, as they are not as much of a result as Parkinson's, but a side effect from medication and can be corrected. Again, if you don't speak up about what's really going on within your homes on a 24-hour basis, doctors can't treat them. Because people are embarrassed or who want to keep things private, they fa fail to ask for help until things really come crashing down. It is easy as an outsider of a situation to think, I could never do that. But when you're a caregiver, you simply do things. I often ask care partners what their line in the sand is. That means, what is the point for yourself that you realize that you simply can't do it anymore? We don't always talk about it, but we need to. For some people, they can deal with a loved one being incontinent, but cognitive changes are too frightening. For others, dementia is relatively easy to deal with, but having to change a diaper or a Depends brief is not something they can do. The line in the sand may be dictated by someone's physical, emotional, or financial limitations. For example, a 90-pound lady may not easily be able to lift a fallen 200-pound man. A person of modest means may not be able to afford to supplement government pro provided in-home care. Different people can only go so far. And you must understand, that's okay. But it is better to think about things in terms of planning for the worst and hoping for the best. Caregiving is satisfying work, says the literature, especially since it is an expression for love, of love for someone who is very important to you. While this may be true, when I think of having to care for someone with a disability on a full-time basis, I think of very hard work. Many caregivers I have spoken to over the years express feelings of being tied down, of feeling isolated, frustrated, sad, and being pushed beyond physical and mental endurance. For many, it means coping with feelings of guilt at having sometimes acted in a resentful or angry way. Caregivers often feel sorry for themselves at being robbed of their lives. They may question what they have done to deserve such misery, and then they feel guilty knowing that they're not the ones with Parkinson's. Caregiving requires a huge commitment to the caring for yourself physically, spiritually, and mentally, not only to enable you to continue to provide care but, just as importantly, to be able to provide quality to your own existence. So you can experience joy as well as heartache, love as well as hurt, and faith as well as despair. Let's look at things a different way. If you're having a hard time admitting you need help, if you feel guilty even thinking that you can't juggle everything yourself, or if you believe that no one else can do your job as well as you can, you may have to step back. Put your emotions on the back burner for a while. Caregiving is made up of a lot of individual tasks, not all of which are of the same importance or require the same skill sets. The best way to get a handle on the help you need is to create an unemotional list 
of all the things that you need to get done. I've only put down a few ideas here, but when we look at what we do over the course of a day, a week, a month, we begin to realize that we really do have a lot on our plates. The main benefit of making a list is that it gives you a map to use in helping yourself get help. Once you have written out your whole list, go over it and decide which things you really like to do and which ones you don't do or you do, excuse me, and which you don't, ones you believe must be done by yourself and which ones you could or should get some help in doing. I'm going to go back to the beginning for a minute and talk again about going on a trip. Before we go on a trip, there are a few things that most of us do. If we're going in the car, we check the tires on the car. We make sure we've got a spare. We make sure we've got a jack to be used to put the spare on if we need it. We pack our bags with extra socks and underwear. And with really long trips, we'll probably even get travel insurance. We do these things not because we hope to blow out a tire, or lose our luggage, or expect we'll need extra clothes, but because we do not want to be caught without, just in case. Just like I talked earlier on preventive forgiveness, we need to think of preventive measures. The reason for this is that if you only wait until a crisis occurs and things have gone too far, then the only number you will be able to call is 911. And I doubt that that is really what you want to do. So let's look at a few things to plan around. Where you live can mean a whole host of things. You need to ask yourself, if my loved one needed any kind of mobility equipment, such as a walker, a bath chair, or a wheelchair, could it be used in your current home? For example, are your doorways wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair? Do we have stairs to worry about? Maybe it's a split-level home that you're living in or even in an apartment building, if, you're, if it's a low-rise building, there you, must have, you might have to use the stairs if there's no elevator. Are you able to modify your home if needed from a structural point of view? This could include anything from installing grab bars to ramps to stair lifts, widening doorways, putting in a walk-in bathtub or a roll-in shower, what if you move to be closer to family? Is your new home in a community that you're comfortable with, with access to your friends, to shopping, to entertainment, or even to a place of worship? If you can no longer drive, do you have an alternate form of transportation? What kind of services are available in your new community? Government-provided services have really shrunk, while community-based agencies have ended up trying to pick up the slack with limited resources. As a result, there are very strict rules for being able to access services. Finally, where are your health care providers? Can you even get a family doctor in your new neighborhood? Many people tell me, I'm going to keep my loved one home. He or she will get better care from me than in a hospital or a nursing home. This is a common feeling that people have, 
So let's look at some starting questions that should be considered. Does your loved one need help with bathing, with toileting, with dressing, with eating? And if so, who is going to provide that help? Does your loved one have slowed thinking? Problems with executive functions such as multitasking? Or is there dementia present? The greater the level of cognitive issues there are, the greater supervision they will need to prevent any accidents from occurring or wandering. In late stages, they could need 24-hour supervision. Do you have any health issues yourself? Are you physically in good enough shape to be able to move your loved one if needs be? Are you able to get sufficient rest? Or does your loved one need care during the night as well? In order for you to do tasks outside of the house, can you safely leave your loved one alone? Does your loved one have falls? If so, how often? Are they able to get up from by themselves from a fall? Or do they require assistance? Are they frail, where a fall could lead to, getting, to having something broken, such as a hip or a wrist or a shoulder? Financial planning is also something that needs to be considered. Government provided services go through your local Community Care Access Center. The acronym for that that you may have heard before is CCAC. These services have been slowly cut back over the years. Most people we speak to are only getting about four hours of care a week. That's really the equivalent of two baths from the CCAC. While there may be additional hours for certain situations, no one is getting 24-7 government funded in-home care. Agencies providing personal support workers cost about $20 to $30 an hour. And this is something that is province-wide. This isn't just here in Central and Northern Ontario. That can mount up very quickly. So, if your loved one requires more than four hours care per week and you need to have additional help, then you need to take those costs of 20 to $30 per hour for a personal support worker to come into your home to help you, you need to take that into very serious consideration. Your loved one may be assessed for various kinds of equipment and home modifications. Some of these may be covered, but some may not be, and you need to know what is covered, by whom, and how much is covered. Please keep in mind that there are limited funding programs for home modification as well as certain types of equipment. And none of these programs pay after the fact. You need to receive pre-approval with an assessment from a qualified professional. If you have stairs, a stair lift can easily run $15,000 and up. Hospital beds can be useful if you need to assist with a lot of dressing or do bed baths, etc. Because a regular bed may be too low to comfortably assist someone. But again, these are a few thousand dollars for a basic manual model. And they are not covered by any program such as the assistive devices program through the government. This is money that will come out of your own pocket. Needing equipment is a reality as the disease progresses. 
whether it's a simple piece of equipment such as a cane or a walker, or more in-depth things such as bath bars. Some equipment can be rented for only a short period of time, but keep in mind that as Parkinson's progresses, the type of equipment needs may change as well. We often liken a care partner to the captain of a battleship. If the captain goes down, we don't want the whole boat to sink. You are the captain in this case. You as care partners can get sick or hurt. You may need a few days, even to a few weeks to recuperate. Back injuries are one of the most common things that happen to care partners, and they are debilitating. Even a nasty virus can not only take you out of action, but it could be lethal for your loved one if the loved one stays with you and you pass that virus on. We regular and regularly encounter people who have even put off surgeries for themselves as the amount of time that they have to recuperate after would interfere with their ability to take care of someone else. As the ship begins to sink, other people scramble to respond to the crisis and no one is left happy. What is your backup plan? Do you have a plan B? Are you counting on your kids or neighbors? If so, have you kept them in the loop of what's going on? Do they know the routines? Do they know medication schedules? Do they know your doctor's names and numbers? And are they able to arrange for time from their own work or their own parenting responsibilities to take over your duties in a crisis? You will be happy to know that usually people are happy to step in to help, but it will be less of a worry to you and them if there is a clear plan of action to follow. If staying at home is no longer an option, people need to look at alternative living arrangements. These often need to be considered in advance as there could be a waiting list of even a few years for your preferred choice. It is important to know that there is a difference in the various types of facilities available, and the names are not synonymous with each other. I am very briefly going to explain the differences between these terms, but would be happy to go into more detail, either at the end of this presentation if you have a question about what I'm saying or you could call me afterwards and I will be happy to provide you with more in-depth information. I'm going to start with a retirement residence. A retirement residence is for healthy seniors. Seniors who do not need government provided care or subsidies seniors who are looking to live in a community of similar interests and lifestyles. When I say healthy seniors, I mean that the mandate of, of, for a retirement residence is that an individual is able to basically provide all their own care. What a retirement center does provide are meals and a change of linen. Other than that, you're basically on your own. Supported or assisted living is for people who may need to have 24-hour availability of either personal care and support, with possible rent geared to income subsidy, and possibly other options of service, such as meals and laundry. It is important to notice, however, that these particular problems are very popular for the reasons mentioned above and in communities where they do exist, and they certainly don't exist in every community, there may be a five to ten year waiting list. 
These programs are usually geared for people whose disabilities are stable and the person is able to self-direct care. That means they're able to tell the people providing care, such as a personal support worker, what it is that they want done. They are not usually geared toward couples. Long-term care facilities are for people who need assistance with activities of daily living and or 24-hour availability of nursing care and high levels of personal care through government-funded nursing and personal care with the possibility of a subsidy. This is not the same as a 24-hour hospitalization. The current monthly co-payment for a basic room is $1,707.59 a month, which boils down to $56 a day. This is the cost for meals and accommodation only. Nursing and personal care is paid for by the government. This is the same cost in every long-term care facility in the province. Respite care can be a short-term stay at a long-term care facility for up to 90 days per calendar year. This can be a, an, a viable option and an available option for caregivers who badly need a break as well as they allow the person living with Parkinson's to try out a different living situation for a change. Some people look on this as a bit of a break away from each other, a bit of a holiday. Respite care costs $36 a day. Finally, just to clear up one more point, there are no Parkinson's specific homes in Ontario. With only 1-2% to of the general population affected by Parkinson's, there may be only a handful of people in any one community at any time who require long-term care. It is easy to want to be the hero and wipe out all the evil challenges in your loved one's life. but. Contrary to the popular belief of most caregivers, you are not indispensable. There are options for you to both continue your relationship while practicing good self-care to hopefully keep you both going for many years. By setting limits and practicing preventive forgiveness, you may be able to give yourself permission to be human, but not superhuman. While I haven't been able to give you all the landmarks that you might see along your road as a caregiver, I hope that I've been able to give you a compass in terms of a few things you need to consider in order to not get lost along your journey. Now I'm available for any questions that you may have. If you'd like to type them in at the bottom of the right-hand column, or again, the option is you can call me at the number listed on the screen, the 1-800-565-3000 number, extension 3375. Hi, Nora Lee. No problem. I didn't realize that you were indeed late, but that's not a problem as far as that's concerned. Did this leave you with, with any questions? We should note as well, for those who've missed it, uh, the session is indeed, as Nora Lee points out, the session will be archived.
Yeah. So we'll be sharing that uh, on our website as we traditionally do over the next few days. Um, with that, I gather that uh, that we do have no further questions, though I see Peter is typing. Um, thus ends the formal presentation. We'll, we'll hang on, as Sandy indicated, for any questions oh, that absolutely. might come up. For sure.